Associate Professor of Creative Writing at UC Riverside, Andrew Weiner is the author of the novels The Marriage Artist and The Color Midnight Maid, and is presently completing his third novel. He frequently publishes essays domestically and internationally on art and artists, and also writes and speaks about matters of philosophical and literary import. Weiner is a recipient of a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship in Fiction. He has previously spoken to the docents about Valesca Suarez, Martin Johnson Heed, and Marsden Hartley. Please join me in welcoming him back to our stage to share his insights on Ellsworth Kelly. Andrew. Maybe I can hold this. Good morning, everyone. Sorry about that. Um, so I thought, uh, you know, I, I came to uh, Ellsworth Kelly's work very late. Um, in fact, probably only in the last uh, year and a half have I really understood or begun to understood Kelly's work. Um, and I've been in the art world for many years and you know I, I'm very familiar with the entire history of 20th century art. So it's, it's sort of embarrassing to me that I overlooked Kelly or I, I actually had sort of negative associations with him. I, I sort of had this idea that he was making almost corporate art. Um, and I, I, f I really do sort of feel ashamed to admit that. Um, I'd see his work in various places and I, it just seemed to be so almost nothing. Um, and now I realize that that was all on me, that um, it was my limitation and my lack of uh, openness to it, my lack of um, sort of imagination and even empathy, and frankly, just sort of a lack of paying attention to it. Um, and I'll sort of, at the end of my talk, I'll reveal how my transformation happened with respect to uh, Ellsworth Kelly's work. But I thought today that I would so sort of share a more personal um, interpretation of, of Kelly's work. Um, than the standard sort of art criticism that we're all used to, to, to reading and, and seeing in catalogs and shows, curatorial type essays and things like that. Um, there's plenty of that around. And uh, I thought I'd try to talk about Kelly in a way that relates to our own lives and how we live and how we go through the world because it turns out that that's very much what his work is about. Um, so um, I thought I'd just show how he started. This was uh, a high school um, journal cover that he did. And you already see sort of a, a simplifying of form, uh, a distillation happening, which, which is definitely what, what happens later in his work. Uh, here's a quote. This is my first abstraction that I did in 47. At school, I had to do a painting that showed different techniques, it's all sort of in there without knowing it. So, so you, you already see that he's dealing with form, uh, scale, the relationship between shapes, right? Um, I should mention that in addition to what, what the introduction said, I was, I was and still am a painter, um, and I was in the art world as a painter for many years. So uh, I'm speaking to you not just as a 
a writer, but as a practitioner of, of painting. Um, wanted you to see what Kelly looked like uh, when he was young. He was very handsome, uh, and he, he seemed to have admirers. <laughs> Early on. Uh, in Boston, yeah. And so he, he studied uh, figurative painting in the, the sort of Boston Expressionist school, initially. As you can see, um, this is an early um, painting and drawing that he did. Whoop, I think it's working now. OK, great. So I'm going to set this down. OK, does this, can you hear me now? Yeah. Wonderful. I'm f freed from the podium, which I can't stand. Um, I'm also I also profess uh, part you know it's part of my part of my living, and um, I never I hate podiums. So I, if you were in a class of mine, I would actually be in the middle of these, <laughs> like Oprah. I teach like Oprah. <laughs> so um, this was an early self-portrait that he did uh, in '49. So what happened is after the war, you know, he studied art, um, figurative painting, and after the war he moves to France. And France is transformative for him in a couple ways that I'm about to talk about. Another self-portrait of him. Very pensive and sort of shy almost, right? Um, almost as if he's hiding from himself. He probably was. Uh, it wasn't easy to be uh, gay at that time, right? Um, so what happens in France are a number of things, but the most important things are his encounters with other artists. Anybody know who this is? Yeah. Or as they say in Romanian, Brancuș. Yeah, Constantine Brancuș. Uh, beautiful, right? Um, so he encounters uh, Brancusi, and uh, as he says uh, in a quote, that it was completely affirming for him to see Brancusi's work because it, it told him that you could use form to do work that is actually spiritual in content. And, uh, and that was, you know, he knew, the thing about Kelly is so fascinating is that he was almost fully formed during this period um, in, in France. He comes out of it already the artist that he's going to be for the rest of his life. And he has a very long, productive, artistic life, basically seven decades. So it's not the story of, the usual story of artists is that they progress. Um, at least in the first part of their, in their young years, they, they make a progression, maybe they, and then they suddenly have some sort of breakthrough. He just broke through right away, basically, and figured, figured himself out as an artist. And he was very independent of the different art movements that were going on, uh, both in, in France, in Europe, and in New York. Because um, as we know, in New York was a major movement happening, which was abstract expressionism, um, you know, de Kooning and, and, and the rest. Uh, and he somehow has the strength to go his own way in the face of these very strong movements that most artists sort of uh, were susceptible to. Another. Brian Cushy. So he, you know, even in this installation of Brian Cushy, you see um, how shapes relate to each other and they, they have emotional content. It's an extraordinary thing that, that shapes can have emotional content. I mean, the, the, human, the human body, the human mind, the human heart, the fact that it can look at a material object and have a feeling about it is um, endlessly mysterious to me um, to this day. And I've been thinking about that um, sort of relationship and, and, and doing work in it for many years. Anybody know who this is? Yeah. Uh, I don't know about you, but I, I just love this work. Uh, there was a fantastic Calder exhibition at Hauser and Wirth in LA. Uh, probably two or three years ago. It might have been during the pandemic, even. Um, <clears throat> they made the whole space, as they should, with Calder white. And then you had these floating objects. So um, Kelly 
develops a, a, a long relationship, uh, not, a friendship with, with Alexander Calder in Paris that continues when they come back to New York after five or six years. There were a lot of Americans in Paris after the war, um, as you probably know. Um, but again, this, this you know, Calder, Calder's work shows him, you know, a couple things. Um, mainly, I would say, the, the way that different shapes speak to each other when they are arranged in certain ways, um, the way they work together, and then the way they can kind of oppose, uh, shapes can oppose each other. And both of those things create all kinds of resonances and meaning. Um, and you know, when you, when you walk through a space and you see work like this, you don't necessarily intellectualize it. You, you absorb it with, first, obviously with the eye, but the eye then goes to the body in a way, especially if there are a certain size in a space, right? So all of that Kelly takes in. And of course, he's in conversation with Calder constantly about, about, about the work. Another, another Calder. Um, anybody recognize this? A plus for anyone who guesses. <laughs> yeah, who said that? You said Gene Arp? Yeah. Gene Arp. So, Jean. Yeah, and Arp is born in Germany. I think he's French, but he's born in Germany, right? Yeah. Um, I've become much more interested in ARP, in the, both ARPs, uh, in the last, you know, 10 years. Um, I really think they're both amazing. So uh, Kelly forms a friendship with, with, with uh, Jean, or Hans, ARP, and um, ARP sort of introduces Kelly to the idea of spontaneity in form, you know, that the idea that you, you face a canvas, you don't know what's going to happen. And you see, what, you see what happens. It's sort of similar to, in writing, um, Ian Forster has this wonderful line that I don't think is a, he, I think he ripped it off from someone. <laughs> he says, um, I can't know what I think until I see what I'm going to say. <laughs> right? So isn't that, isn't, isn't that lovely? Um, which, as a writer, is absolutely the case. You know, I, I never know with each sentence, what I think until I, until I articulate it in the sentence. And then I'm like, oh, that's what I think. You know? <laughs> but you discover, the, the, the point being that as you're writing or as you're painting, you discover what you think. Right? You don't a priori just think everything. That's a conviction. And uh, I'm writing a book on, on Nietzsche right now. And Nietzsche thinks convictions are uh, a, a prison, a prison that you should avoid convictions at all costs. So um, this idea of, uh, and it's a good way to live, right? Each day, you, you, don't know, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what you're going to do necessarily, even though you have a plan. You don't know what you're going to say. You can't anticipate interactions with people. Um, so to be able to live in the present and accept spontaneous change and uh, metamorphosis in, in, your, in your life, that's, uh, this is sort of a metaphor for that, this kind of, this kind of work. More art. So that's, the last one is, is also Jean, but then we transition to Sophie Tauber, Arp. okay? And these are, um, these are, uh, almost like a woven, they're woven pieces in very thick kind of coarse burlap, right? So it's like yarn or, or something. And it's very, it's impossible to see in a reproduction. They're very small. And these are some of the, these are some of the most precious works of art. They're so good. Has anybody ever seen them up close? Highly recommend if you can, if you can get your eyes on, on one of Sophie Tauber art. Tauber's pieces uh, in person. It can, it's, it'll be life changing. They're so beautiful. Uh, so, this is her sort of early work. Oh, well, let me just, yeah, this is more of Sophie Tauber's paintings. 
So you see in, in, in Sophie Tauber Arp, <clears throat> in a way it reminds me of Brancusi because there's a lyricism to the, to the shape, right? Um, to the shapes that she's, but even here you see the relationship between, she's really doing a lot of work with how objects or shapes um, sort of um, combine to create tensions where the edges meet, things like that. So um, I don't think that Ellsworth Kelly met her, but Jean showed, her all, showed him all of her, her work, especially the early work, where there was more spontaneity. Um, so I'm going to go back to the Stevens poem. I've actually, uh, you know, disclosure, I've used this poem before in a talk here, I think. Uh, but it's so apt that I just couldn't help myself. Um, I'm sure you all know Wallace Stevens. Uh, this is July Mountain, so he's, the poet is taking a walk. Right? We live in a constellation of patches and of pitches, not in a single world. So right there, I'm already in Ellsworth Kelly territory and in the territory of all these artists. Um, the idea that the things of the world are in a constellation and that our relationship to them is one of sort of fragments, pitches and patches, right? So he's taking a walk. He's probably noticing the light, the dappled light and things like that. In things said well in music, so there's a, there's a line about form, the beauty of form. Uh, on the piano and in speech, as in a page of poetry. Thinkers without final thoughts. So beautiful. So again, that idea that we don't know everything. We don't, we don't have the convictions, right? Um, we're open. We're, we're open. Our eyes are open. In an always incipient cosmos, right? So the incipient, good question. What does incipient mean? Anybody want to? I'm, now I'm the professor. Who would like to define incipient? <laughs> no? Coming into being. Yeah. Yeah, early. It can mean nascent, right? Nascent, uh, just coming into being. But it's really about the process of still becoming something. So in other words, the cosmos is not finished. It's unfinished. And it's always, it's an ongoing um, event, right? The way when we climb a mountain, Vermont throws itself together. <laughs> Isn't that lovely? It's so true. When you take a walk, you know, Vermont's throwing itself together in, before my eyes. But it throws itself together. So that suggests sort of a haphazard coming together of things, right? Um, but this idea of disparate pieces coming together to form something very much is related to many artists, but, but Ellsworth Kelly in particular. Um, I just couldn't help myself but show a few more uh, of Sophie Tauber Arp's work. Um, uh, so here's young Kelly, returns to New York, and he's already He's already got his idea of simplifying form um, in a couple different ways. Right? So you have, you have color. He, he's simplifying it, things in terms of color, shape, and sort of mass, right? the, the mass of something. Here he's experimenting with different fragments that he's cut up. Uh, I also, just on the personal side, um, a very important figure for him for a while was the artist Robert Indiana, whom you must, many of you probably remember from the love pieces. Uh, and they met when Kelly, uh, Indiana was working at the paint store in lower Manhattan, and Kelly walks in and asks, do you, do you have a, a postcard of Matisse, of a Matisse? <laughs> He just asked that question, and that was the beginning of their, their, their love. Um, and I just love this photo. You can see, I think that's Trinity uh, Church, right? 
Um, sometimes New York just never seems to change. I mean, the cars are different, but that just looks exactly like it's still does. Um, and uh, so Indiana and, uh, and Kelly. And then, of course, as things do, the relationship ended in a, in a terrible way, dramatic way. And Robert Indiana was never quite the same. And he wrote this, these beautiful sort of grieving poems. Um, my love, my love is gone to you, like two faces that cannot but turn into each other, warm and fierce, whose lips are mated flowers, the long petals growing, knowing search for their sons, beloving. Yeah, You're just heartbroken. There's nothing like heartbreak to generate poetry. <laughs> um, and then later, uh, Kelly met his lifelong partner, Patrick. And there's a picture of them sort of in middle age, and then much later. It's so lovely that they managed to, to stay together. They got married eventually and had a life together. So back to Ellsworth, young Ellsworth. <laughs> this is him uh, when he lived on, on Bro Broad Street downtown. And you see he's already doing his thing, his grids. We'll get to that in a second. I just wanted to show you. He, he, he came down to the street and someone photographed him in a series of photographs. Um, yeah, let me, yeah, I think we're ready to, okay, so, um, <clears throat> you know, the occasion for my talk, of course, is the, the show that's up right now, the exhibition uh, that, that Charlie Wiley put together, a fantastic show. I, I assume you've all seen it. Um, and I, I believe that most of you got a chance to hear Charlie give, uh, give a talk on the show, which I thought was very beautiful and lovely. And uh, I thought he, I, think, I think he put together a really important show of photographs, because the photographs sort of reveal everything about um, Ellsworth Kelly's process. And, but not just that, about how he looks at the world and how he lived, and kind of clues to how we might take a, take a cue from him. So the photos have a lot to, to reveal to us. Um, I want to, before we look at a few of the photos, I want to go back to another poem, which I may have used before. Uh, many of you probably have heard of Gerard Banley Hopkins. Very famous poem. Um, it's sort of a religious poem. He, he, was, he was a religious figure. Um, Glory be to God for dappled things, for skies of couple color as a brinded cow, for rose moles, all in stipple among, upon trout that swim, fresh fire coal chestnut falls, finches wings. So <clears throat> um, in a few moments, I'll show you uh, a few images of birds because uh, in a way, the thing that got Ellsworth Kelly started as a very young person, I mean, he was five years old, uh, was birds. Um, and uh, there's a story where he followed a, um, a blackbird into uh, the woods. And it brought, it sort of was um, this almost um, ritual entrance of the young man, of the artist, into another realm. Because he goes into the forest and he starts looking at birds. And he looks at their wings, he looks at their colors more than anything else. And he sees these little flashes of extraordinary color. Because as we know, in North America, the, the, uh, in the New World, the birds are extraordinary, um, the colors. And um, it sort of gets him onto this idea that color and form, the shape of the birds, ought to be something that's free, that's freed up, and has sort of an independent life of its own. It becomes very important for him. But he takes that in as a, as a boy. Uh, but then becomes sort of obsessed with Audubon and, and, and birds for, for the rest of his life. And, uh, yeah. Landscape plotted in peace. So you notice all these, what Hopkins is doing here is talking about fragments. <clears throat> Fold, fallow, and plow. I love his the sound. I mean, the thing about Hopkins is or the sound of his lines and sentences, right? And all trades, their gear and tackle and trim. All things counter 
original spare strange. That line, in a way, speaks the most to me about Kelly's work. Because what Kelly, part of what he does is he extracts um, shapes and images and objects from the world and he goes to work on them, turning them into something that is original and strange, strange in the best sense of, um, um, there was a, a great Russian visual theorist named Shklovsky, Shklovsky, sorry, who said, that we ought to look at the world through an estranged eye, right? So in other words, the idea of um, curing ourselves of hab habits of looking, of habits of thought, um, almost like a practice, like a, you could call it a spiritual practice, a meditation practice, or just a practice of being alive in the physical world. But trying to take in the world uh, in a way that's counter to habit, because we all develop. We can easily, it's like when we drive. We can, we can drive through town and get to one place to the other without thinking about anything, <laughs> about, about even thinking uh, consciously about what we're seeing out the window. Um, it's, there's something, we can drive unconsciously, but we can also walk through the world unconsciously. Whatever is fickle, freckled, who knows how, with swift, slow, sweet, sour, a dazzle, dim. And I like that slow and sweet because one of the things that a good painter does is ask us to pause and to slow down. The object is sort of, you know, it's, it's in an arena of privilege where, where we will, it's meant to be contemplated in a different way than a doorknob. Although Kelly would say that you should contemplate the doorknob. You know, in a way he was a Buddhist in some ways. You know, contemplate the doorknob, <laughs> like a, a cone. Um, anyway, he fathers forth whose beauty is past change, praise him. Yeah. So it's a poem of praise. And I would argue that all, all, all serious art are works of praise. They praise the world in different ways even when they're sort of in contention with the world, right? So <clears throat> those of you who've walked through the show, most of you probably, Kelly was looking at things that people just pass by. You know, that's a, kind of a cement uh, walkway. And he doesn't even photograph the walkway. He photographs the corner of the of the form and the rail, some, the shadow on steps. And what we see is an artist completely alive to what's there. Everything is speaking to him. And uh, I would argue that that's really an ecstatic way of being in the world. It's ecstatic in the sense that things are animated, things are Things are speaking to you, that things are alive. And you're alive to, to it. And you're sort of in a dance with the material world. Or shadow. And you see, you see the paintings. You see him already. And this is early, very early. Um, so he's already, he's already doing his thing. It's kind of fascinating. These corners of houses, roofs. And one of the things that finally woke me up to, if, I mean, if I had seen Charlie's show uh, 30 years ago, I would have been awake to Kelly the whole time. This would have, this would have told me everything. That's why his show is so important. Um, because you see, you see what he's doing. Without, without these photographs, you know, I'd, I'd never seen them. Um, and so I didn't understand the work. So here, it's not only the form, but it's the shadow, but it's also the size of this in relation to the rest of it, right? The sort of, the way it divides the picture, but then it's not completely um, symmetric. 
And so you have sort of the ground. This is the ground, and this is the figure, right? And the figure ground relationship, which is important to all painting, <clears throat> is something that Kelly works with in a very unique way. Um, when I first started seriously thinking about his work, I, I thought, well, he's gotten rid of the figure ground relationship. There is none, but I was wrong. And we'll talk, I'll, I'll talk more about that. Uh, of course, he lived in Paris, and what was he looking at? He was looking at the sides of of buildings, you know, I, I, I've always, I bet some of you have too, the way that the French just would end a building like this with a wall that it was the shape of the, it's so sort of brutal and interesting and obviously must be functional because you have the supporting, you have the supporting um, wall that kind of holds it up. But it was, a, it was a way to, for a building to keep in its space. <laughs> and not go an inch over, right? Because every inch counts in Paris. Uh, so <clears throat> this photo and uh, another one that follows it, of I think it's Pont Neuf um, over the Seine, turns out to be sort of the transformative photo or the transformative image that Kelly notices while living in Paris. Um, that's not mine, is it? OK. Um, it really le leads to a metamorphosis for him. And me metamorphosis is so important for, for artists, but also for us, I think. Uh, he sees this arc, and he doesn't look at the bridge. He looks at the negative space that the arc creates. That's what interests him. Uh, and that's, that was unique. Uh, that was, that's uh, Ellsworth Kelly's very particular sensibility is that he was looking at negative space early, early on. He also loved the medieval churches. This is a Cathedral of Notre Dame in, in a smaller town. It's not, obviously not the main Notre Dame, but um, he loved these arches. Loved those, and he loved, he loved the symmetry of them. All these. He loved. he loved the medieval architecture. He loved Byzantine architecture. But he was using them, right? So an artist looks at something and he says, what can I, what can I take? <laughs> an artist takes from the world and takes from other artists. and Not to plagiarize, but to use and transform and to make something new. Right? That's, writers do it, too. Here's the other one. Uh, he took, over the years, over the years, he took many pictures of the bridges over the Seine. But again, it was the arcs, right? And this one, <coughs> I think what he loved was the series, right? So you, look at that. That's, a, that's an, a future Ellsworth Kelly painting right there. And Calder, exactly. Good point, yeah. So the, the painting derived from nothing, in a way. So this is a very early piece that he does based on the negative space in the bridge. Very early painting. Uh, and this is his first sort of serious painting that he ever did. Um, so he already, <clears throat> I mean, what's extraordinary to me, because I understand what it, how difficult it is for any artist to sort of arrive at what they're going to be. Uh, you know, Nietzsche has this very famous line where he says, um, you need to become what you are. <laughs> it's so interesting, right? Because becoming suggests turning into something new. But he says, become what you are, which suggests you're becoming what you already are. <laughs> um, I think there's a lot to read into that line. But Kelly sort of becomes what he is with, the, with this very early painting of form. And what's important to notice is that what I didn't notice early on was I thought, he's just using primary colors right out of the can. He wasn't doing anything of the kind. Uh, he spent a great deal of time mixing colors that were would approach the primary color, but would be on just either side of it. Right? There, there, he would mix other um, hues in with it, and even other colors to vary things like warmth, coldness, hue, value, all those things. 
He was a perfectionist, spent a ton of time mixing paints. And also many, many layers of paint, always flat, no shine. Many layers until he got a certain heft in the paint that felt like the painting was becoming an object, essentially. Right? His paintings are objects. And conversely, his sculptures are paintings. <clears throat> uh, so now we're really getting into the work. Um, and this is a much later piece, but I kind of throw it right in because, again, with Kelly, he, there's no progression. He's, he's already got his sort of vocabulary going and his method. He doesn't know what any one painting is going to turn out to be. He's still, actually, there's a, a lot of spontaneous deci decisions being made. Because um, what he does initially is he, he, he pencils out the painting in a drawing. And he sees what it's going to be. And then he, then he has, then he cuts the shape. He, you know, if it's a shaped canvas, he has it cut out of wood or metal. Um, and, but he's playing around with size. The first thing he does is he plays around with form and size. And the last thing is color. And he says that he felt that color comes from, fo from form. The color comes last. And he had this beautiful way of thinking about arriving at a color. He said, um, I have to name the colors. And what he means is discover the colors. Yeah. Um, the other thing I sort of wanted to mention um, that I've noticed in his work is that unlike the abstract expressionists of his generation um, who were flinging paint onto the, onto the canvas in the, these gestural ways that were meant to sort of express their identity, really, their feelings, their... Um, I mean, if you look at de Kooning, who I, I love. I mean, I think de Kooning's extraordinary. He's one of the greatest of all time. But de Kooning sort of is expressing something with, with that work, right? And even Rothko, with all that modulated tone, there's something about the gesture of the arm that is meant to be attached to the, the soul, you know, and the spirit and the sort of being of the artist. So the artist in abstract expressionism is, is getting herself or himself onto the canvas. Kelly goes a completely different other way. And I would argue that his work is egoless. And that's very unique. Um, he did, I would say he had that in common with a few other post-abstract artists, like Lichtenstein, uh, even Rauschenberg and Johns a bit. They were more egoless. They, they learned from the over, <laughs> sort of, the over self-estimation of the abstract expressionists and became more humble in some ways. Or cooler. They just wanted a cooler way of working that wasn't putting their whole identity on the line. Uh, yeah. Um, <clears throat> I don't know about you, but as I've gotten older, yellow has become so important. Does that happen for anybody? Yes. What is that? What is it? Sun. What? Sun. sun. We become more attached to sun. Maybe, yeah, as, as we become aware of our mortality, the sun life, yeah. But I would also, the other thing I notice about yellow and, and these, Kelly's work, it's free of anxiety. You know? It's free of fret and worry. And that's extraordinary um, and sort of distinct, it seems to me. So much art is, has, has fret in it. Uh, <clears throat> they're also free of gravity. And that's huge. Um, yeah. I couldn't get enough of the yellow. I just wanted to show you yellow. I mean, <laughs> if I had my way, this entire talk would be yellow. <laughs> uh, 
but part of the thing is, what's so interesting is in, in Kelly is the tension between abstraction and the real world. Okay, so he's obviously, as, as the photos show, he's, he's looking at the real world and he's completely engaged with it, ecstatically really. And yet, he makes paintings in which he abstracts what he sees. These, these flashes of apprehension that he has. He then makes these objects that are abstract. And abstraction takes us out of time, right? It's more of an eternal, almost a platonic uh, type of form, right? Pure form. Um, so that's, that's I, I think, in a way, Kelly was tackling one of humankind's biggest problems, <laughs> which is how do we reconcile ourselves as living creatures who are constantly in a state of becoming and dying, really? Decay and entropy and all that. The material world that sort of isn't very kind to us in some ways. Gravity, right? Gravity in, in the end kills us. Uh, how do you reconcile that with a longing that, that humans seem to have for the eternal, for something lasting, for something that stays beyond this life, um, something that doesn't even in this life, something that doesn't change? You know, sometimes we go to nature, it seems to me, for that sense of, well, if it's preserved, <laughs> you know, like Yosemite or wherever it is, this hasn't changed in my entire life. The truth is it's completely changed. <laughs> the animals are all different, you know, um, erosion, all kinds of forces. But there's a, a larger feeling that we get, you know, if you go to somewhere like Canyon de Chez or the Grand Canyon, you get a sense of time that is so much on such a different scale, the age of the Earth, right? The age of the, of the stars, the cosmos. We, we sort of long for that, even if you're not a religious, spiritual person, if you're completely secular, you still long for, a, there's a party that doesn't want change, doesn't want entropy. And if, <clears throat> you know, an artist who takes from the, the material world and distills some, a, a part of it, and turns it into this new autonomous object that is abstract, he's dealing, he's grappling with that problem of time versus uh, pure form and the eternal. It's the, it's the problem that philosophers have also dealt with for, uh, from forever, starting with Plato. I mean, not actually pre, the pre-Socratics, but Plato really, really went, took it far. And of course, Plato leads to Christianity, you know? And then, then you have Kant. Now I'm going to start talking philosophy. <laughs> but Kant also wrestles with this idea of this tension between the present and how it's, it's always changing and something that stays, and an eternal law, right? I love this piece. Um, I don't know about you, but <clears throat> there's so much going on in it. The colors are 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 muted in some ways, right? Um, those are not primary. Um, and then you have the shape, something about that, that oval, the handmade quality of it, but also the amount of, of this color that he allows, the relationship of the oval to the square and then to the rectangle and then all of that to the whole. We don't think about it, but our, our bodies take in all those relationships. And if you're, especially if you're standing in front of it, the real thing. Yeah. I wanted to show this because it was it's such a different palette. Um, and, but again, you see these negative spaces that are taken from you know, it could be an inverted bridge, right? Could be a shadow that he saw somewhere. <clears throat> um, the other thing that I derive from his work is his use of memory. Um, I would argue that these paintings are sort of, because they are taken from moments where he saw something, whether he photographed it or he just remembered it or he drew it, he then transforms 
the memory. It's like memory transformed. Um, and I would say I would say that there's two kinds of memory that he's sort of trafficking in. There's the sort of <clears throat> intellectual memory that is able to synthesize everything to take a shape and and uh, make it into something and transform it. And then there's the more humbler kind of memory, which really just, we all have it, where we just remember flashes of something. Little instants that we carry with us for years. You know, the light on a wall that we once saw in some room, in our house maybe. Um, the flash of someone's face as they were saying something. That, that, that kind of memory is the fragment memory, the, the part that stores all these fragments of experience. And it's, it's very clear that, that an artist like Ellsworth Kelly is using both of those memories to make his work, that his work is actually um, a physical manifestation of, of memory. Something very beautiful about that, and I would argue he would probably say spiritual. So Kelly was very, very, so what happens at a certain point, this is back to the figure ground thing that paintings, you know, usually in a painting you have a figure and then you have a ground, right? Well, Kelly actually, after sort of denying that for years, in the 60s he sort of frees himself up to do shapes and even physical shapes. So there's like, this is not a great image, but there's a shadow cast. Right? Um, so this, you, you would say this is the figure, this is the ground. Right? And so part of the way the painting works is that. But also, <clears throat> especially with the shaped uh, paintings, the wall of the gallery or the uh, exhibition becomes the ground. Um, and even on a bigger scale, the rect you know, all galleries pretty much are rec rectangular. So that becomes the frame for his work. And that is why he spent so much time and he was so involved in hanging all his shows while he was alive. He would come in and just make myriad adjustments uh, between the, the space between the work, how high it was, what shapes were gonna go where. That was all extremely important to him because the truth is the whole thing was a painting. <laughs> the whole thing was a composition. Aren't these lovely? <clears throat> um, the other thing I want to say is that, to go back to the egoless thing, it's more than that, I would say, for Kelly. And for, for artists who are like him, and I think this is true of the artists that he loved, like Brancusi, <clears throat> that they see, they see an image, they remember it, and then they, it's, there's something in them, whether you want to call it their, their soul, just their, their, the makeup, the way they're constituted, that has a need and a hunger to spend a great deal of effort transforming that memory into something for other people, not just for the self, right? It's, they're not journaling to themselves. They're making work for others with the idea that their own hungers and needs in this regard that we've been talking about might nurture other people who come to those spaces with the same needs, right? To, to, to sort of feed their, those souls, essentially. So I'd argue that an artist like Kelly is in a, is part of his practice is one of generosity at a very sort of deep human level. You don't spend this much time <laughs> making adjustments, making objects for yourself. It's outward looking. It's outward looking from the beginning because he's looking out at the world and really awake to the world. Um, so if there's anything you could call spiritual, in a way it's that. It doesn't have to be religious, but spiritual in the sense of 
doing something for others that is really meaningful. So here is, <clears throat> he came to do shaped canvases, and that's when the wall became so important. The dimensions of the shape in relation to the wall. He, 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 he transferred it to sculpture as well, which is so lovely. <clears throat> so this is a sculptor, a sculpture, but he, he wanted to still be dealing in flat planes, so he essentially turned his sculptures into paintings. But what's amazing about them, <clears throat> you know, initially when he was young, he said, I don't want to deal with edges. Um, in, in, what he meant was in a painting, because that, that's, old, that's the old thing, figurative painting, all the old styles of painting, including the abstract expressionists. They, were all, they all had to deal with what happens when two colors meet each other, what happens when a figure meets the background. Right? The edge is how an artist handles the edge mean, means a great deal. He wanted to get rid of that, but it turns out in his when he, especially when he starts doing sculpture, the edge of the piece has a relationship to, you know, the tree, to, the, to everything else around it. So it activates the entire space, right? It, he creates these objects that come from the world, they're distilled, they're transformed, and then they change the world again once they go back out into it. They become their own objects that are every bit as sort of warranted as the objects that he initially noticed. But they're new. Uh, OK, so when he was, when he, you know, in his later years, Kelly was selling paintings for, you know, three million a pop, right? Uh, and a lot of them. <laughs> I mean, what's interesting is he still lived up in Spencertown and, um, um, you know, sort of humbly, actually. At any rate, uh, in the early years, he had no money. And, but he was still sort of wanting to interact with the public space. So these are his a way of doing sculptures. <laughs> these are postcards. He did a lot of these postcards. And it was a way to put sort of sculptural figures in these big outdoor public spaces. I really like these postcards. Um, you know, he wanted to see what would happen when you put a shape over or in the, you know, these anticipate the sculptures, right? This is Palm Springs. You can see he was sort of into the body. <laughs> yeah. He says, what I've tried to capture is the reality of flux, to keep Art, an open, incomplete situation, to get at the rapture of seeing. I mean, his, it's been said many times about his work that his is an art of perception. Um, but I love the word rapture, right? He was, he was dancing with his, when he was seeing, he was dancing with the world. I love this. This was the famous show he had at the, Guggenheim, and in order to fit his paintings, he had to, he had to build false walls that came out from the curves. And people, you know, when he was offered the show, people said, you'll never be able to do it. Your work's not going to work in the Guggenheim. But I think it's just absolutely stunning. Um, I love this shot. Of, it's, it's a delight, right? I mean, it's... I wanted to show you just little snippets from his life, from his studio. Um, he kept things from his different shows. There's a portrait of his, of his dad on his deathbed up there that he drew. Little plans. Um, artists that he loved, that Ilmer's glue. <laughs> this is him and uh, Roy Lichtenstein. Um, in a way, those two had as much resonance and in common as he had with Calder. 
Um, it might not be readily apparent, but Lichtenstein was actually interested in very similar things. He was using cartoons and forms uh, and, and line, but he was very, Lichtenstein was very interested in color, shape, form, size, and the relationship between those things. And also a pared down, sort of cooler, less egotistical approach. Uh, he kept his poster for his first show ever in the US. So sweet. Um, fabric sample from a Calvin Klein dress, you know, for, for painting ideas. And then different influence, you see Max Beckman. He loved Beckman, the uh, German expressionist. Um, Holbein, different great painters, obviously. Uh, gifts from Alexander Calder. <laughs> Yeah. <sighs> Elmer's glue, crayons, yeah. Uh, I wanted to show his shoes. You know, part of, the, it's the daily life of a painter. Um, how do, they, what do they wear when they paint? Uh, what are their studios? <laughs> yeah, it's true. They wear paint, yeah. Um, I, I, I recently saw a picture of Lucian Freud's studio, and what a mess. I mean, wow. Uh, but you know, I have artist friends who keep the most immaculate studios. If there's a, a little bit of paint that gets on the cement floor, they go down with a napkin and immediately wipe it off. Right? So clearly, uh, Kelly wasn't doing that. There he is. So he uh, became aware at a certain point that he was poisoning himself <laughs> using these paints. And he started wearing a mask. Um, and it, almost like a hazmat suit or something, you know, protecting himself. Uh, but here you see he's not paying an assistant to do his work, right? He's patiently applying layer after layer. They have to dry over sometimes a week between layers. All this sort of goes against my initial impression of him, which was, just spray paints a shape canvas or something, you know. I, I really had such a limited view. Um, he got into wood sculptures I just love. Uh, and it's hard to see, but this, this piece comes out, right? So it's in, there's a sculptural object kind of feel to it. <clears throat> so I wanted to show you, he loved the American Red Start. Do we have any bird birders in the room? I love this bird too. Uh, uh, and what he, what he, of course, what, what Kelly was looking at were, was this, right? But also the black, which is sort of a negative space around the yellow, right? Fascinated with these birds. Uh, and I, I gave a talk here on Marsden Hartley. Some of you, is that my alarm to call? Um, some of you might have, might have been here. But I, I thought it was really something Marsden Hartley said was quite apt. I've always said that you do not see a thing until you look away from it. In other words, an object or a fact in nature has not become itself until it has been projected in the realm of imagination. Therefore, what has been retained in the mind's eye is what lives. I've seldom or never worked from nature for this reason. And so what I see is what I believe to be true. And that becomes the truism of the creative artist. Um, this is terrible, you can't see it, but maybe that's a little better. I love his drawings, very simple, very simple line drawings of nature. So Kelly did not make a distinction between the biological, physiological world, uh, fauna and flora, and skyscrapers, <laughs> right? So, uh, you know, when he came back to New York, for example, from Paris, he was obsessed with all the curves. He saw so many curves in New York. And that's what got him on the paintings. But they're human created, so he considered that part of nature too. I'm constantly investigating nature. Nature meaning everything. There you go. I love the beanstalks that he did. That was later from 19, almost 2000. Uh, so I wanted to, <clears throat> as, as I get toward sort of the end of my talk, I wanted to return to the show here 
uh, now that we've looked at some of the paintings, because I think you can see, you know, this is, <laughs> this prefigures uh, a lot of his work, right? The, the, the negative space, this is a, <clears throat> a barn um, that just has a piece of plywood and then the hayloft or whatever's in there, but he uses the black space, that shape. Same here, All right? So that's, that's this cut in the wood and then you see the light and the darkness there, but that becomes a painting. Um, you, you've seen some of these. It's broken glass. So he's using the negative space. And this is in the 50s, so he's very, he's very alive. He's walking around constantly taking these photos. Sidewalk. Uh, I wanted to sort of transition to the end to his notebooks because something happens in his notebooks that is very freeing, I think. Um, they become, he's, it was often doing these on a bus. For, I don't know why he was on a bus so much. But uh, he, he, they're all called bus sketches. Uh, but he's, there's something about seeing the loose brush strokes that he doesn't allow in the paintings that I just love. And they sort of let some air in. They let air into the work. Um, they're less an object, and they're more, they're sort of more paintings, aren't they, in a sense? Look at that. Absolutely. They're so simple, but so beautiful. <clears throat> they have light in them. Love these. Just love them. He clearly was interested in organic shapes. Uh, so <clears throat> sort of bringing it all home, this is when I changed my take on Ellsworth Kelly. Uh, when I, 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 I still haven't been there, <laughs> but I, I started, I first saw an image of the chapel that he did in Austin, Texas, and I thought, what? <laughs> you know, that, okay, that's, that's not, that's not corporate, the corporate artist guy, that's, that's not that. Uh, what is he doing? And so I started to really look at what he was doing with this. The chapel, and I realized, okay, this, there's a lot to this artist. Um, this was one of the last things he did, and he left it to the world. And extraordinary, the way the light comes in. And of course, knowing Kelly, the, the shape of these, the, the spacing of, of the light, the reflections, are everything to him, right? He found a way to make a chapel, even in a secular world. Isn't that amazing? I like this, I'm, I, I've sort of often, you know, I've, I've, I've admired the work of James Terrell, the light artist over the years. I like this better, There's something about it. So once I saw these, then I, I had to reflect back on, on the work in the way that I'm sort of sharing with you now. I guess that's it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, I just want a parting, a parting thing I just want to say is that I hope that you'll, there's something I said in this talk that you'll take with you and sort of apply to your life, because that's what, that's what we're all doing here. That's the reason to be interested in art and to be looking at art and to be engaging with it, is, to, is to, that it, it changes the way that you look at the rest of the world when you're out in the world. Um, I remember, I'll just share, I, I once um, went to an exhibition of Constable's Landscapes in London. And I walked outside and I took a walk through Hyde Park. And I was ecstatic. It, it, everything changed. The sky, the trees, the ground. Uh, so art can really change the way you go through your day. And I hope that will happen for you. So thank you for coming. If there, I, yeah. Um, I'm not sure if we want to do questions. We, we don't need to, but if there are any, I'd, I'd try to entertain them. Yeah. Regarding his photographs from the very beginning, I uh, was struck by the idea that the Greeks, when the photography uh, came with light, ah, yeah. his photography was absolutely 
Yeah. And he was right. Yeah. And the other thing I wanted to reference is that it's, you know, I'm not an artist, but yeah. it's, it's hard to imagine an artist who has a, a favorite color. Yet I've <laughs> spoken to many artists. Yeah. I come from an artistic family. Yeah. And they did have favorite colors. Yeah. And I am reminded by Van Gogh, who said, yellow is my favorite color. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's so funny because I... But isn't that life? Isn't yellow yeah. life? Yeah. So, but, you know, when I was young, I don't know about you, but I loved blue. Everyone, Everyone loves blue. Every boy loves blue. Every boy loves blue. Every boy loves blue and every girl loves pink. Yeah. And I'm actually red and green challenged, uh, like many boys, right? Uh, but I didn't, I didn't even think about yellow until I was, you know, probably in my 40s. Um, and now it's the most important color. I get, I, absolutely, it's number one. I'm with Van Gogh. <laughs> so... Thank you for that. Yeah. Anyone? Yes. Yeah, I was wondering about what you think about the shape of our country after uh, five and eleven. Yeah. I was wondering, do you see anything with the quality of education now that we have? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know the answer to that. I think he he certainly had commissions where that he, that was the case. When he had commissions, um, I would imagine he was pretty aware of where. You know, just knowing artists now, the artists that I am friends with, they are always working on a show. Like, I'm, they'll say, I have a show in Paris coming up. So they know, they sort of have an idea of the space. And I bet he did more than almost any other artist, uh, I, I can imagine, maybe Frank Stella or something. But he, I'm sure he probably, my guess is he was thinking about the space. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he definitely did a lot of site specific installations. And he considered the whole installation a painting, basically. Yeah. yeah. So why is he most famous for all his yellow and blue? <laughs> <laughs> is that I don't I don't is that a thing? I don't I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I'd like to go back to the, that photo of Bush when he was at the gate and he stood for prayer with the same color. Ah, and yeah. He was standing with his arm open to pray for him. There's a lot of similarity between the color of his hair. Mm. It's true that when you really like something, it isn't, the giant changes are rejected, as they say. And you can see things from a very quick painting and see it goes on through the course of life. Would you think about that? Yeah, and it's, it's, it's good you brought that up because I forgot to mention that for the last part of his life, like probably the last 30 years, he wasn't so much looking at, at things out in the world, but he was looking at his own paintings. And he was, he was, because he had so many by that, you know, he built up a whole repertoire and uh, he could go back and look at shapes and just take from himself and redo things. You're absolutely right that he, he took those things and went like that, right? That's a very good observation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming. Thank you.